That ain't good. Custom man cap with JB Weld. So this is the home we're gonna be using. Ever wonder how long it takes to prime a new engine? 15 bucks and you got a draw through blower carb. Well, the factory small block drove us 750 miles home from Arkansas. It was quiet, reliable, and sluggish. And if I wanted those things, I'd drive a Toyota. Like my wife. As fate would have it, I found a cheap used blower on the face space. Let's throw it on this small block and see how long it holds together. Blower. I really didn't do a lot of filming this morning because I've been trying to beat the rain. Had to get the old powertrain out of the truck and get it into the garage before the storm came. That ain't good. Maybe take it easy on the aluminum parts. All right, I used my big orange hammer and broke it down into more manageable pieces. I got my transmission, bell housing, flywheel and clutch. And I have hit my first stopping point. My engine stand is set up for LS and LS bell housing bolts are Canadian thread. So I had to go to the parts store and get some long US thread bolts. Hit it with about three coats of purple stuff and a bunch of water. It's clean enough to work on. That's about it. So Okay, it's been about three hours. Got the engine torn completely apart. Well, I couldn't find my harmonic balancer puller, so I couldn't get the crank out or cam, but everything we needed to get out for measuring purposes is out. It looks good. Um, I think everything's standard. I gotta get the gauges out and mic everything. One little boo-boo, I, uh, I dropped a piston. It will end it square on my crock, but uh, still managed to snap that skirt off. So looks like I'm at least gonna be buying one piston in addition to the re-ring kit, but that's no big deal. Thing is, like the easy part's done. Like the hard part starts now, and that's cleaning up all this jazz because these things aren't in amazing shape. I've spent the last few days just cleaning engine parts. It's really the most time consuming part of building an engine for me. That distributor shaft should give you some indication of what the rest of the inside of the engine look like. I'm sure there's worse out there, but this one's pretty gummy. Uh, I got all the valve train cleaned except for one push rod nut and such. I just wanted to leave this dirty so you could see what we're working with. I got a parts washer there filled with a BP number 87 parts cleaner. Another parts cleaning station here. I'm not gonna tell you what's in there because the internet will say it's unsafe. You know me, safety third. But we're almost finished up cleaning everything. I got the block clean enough to work on. I mocked all the bores with my Fowler bore gauge. I'll leave a link in the description for the Amazons. So a bore gauge on its own doesn't give you a measurement. It, it'll it give you a difference in measurements. You gotta have a micrometer to set it to a specific measurement. I'm actually not gonna mic the cylinders. I have micrometers, but I don't care. I'm gonna use the old pistons anyway, so it doesn't really matter. I just wanted to figure out how much taper and out of round the cylinders had. I zeroed the gauge at the top of the number two cylinder, here, there. So all of these measurements are numbers in thousands relative to the very top of the number two cylinder. Don't know why, that's just where I started. So there's no vertical scoring or scratching in the cylinders. Everything looks good, so this is a perfect candidate for a bottle brush rebuild. This is more appropriate. So this is the home we're gonna be using for this engine. This is from, was it Brush Research Manufacturing? It's a flex home, it's available on the Amazon, I'll leave a link. Uh, this is a four and an eight inch diameter, which is the right size for our four inch bore. This is also a 240 grit home. So we're running a cast iron ring on our small block Chevy here. And the 240 grit gives you the proper surface finish on the cylinder uh, for that style of ring. Um, that's what you need to get the ring to seat to the cylinder. Now, if you're using a uh, molly ring or something like on an LS or something, you really want to check to make sure you get the appropriate grit hone because those rings are a lot harder. So make sure you get the proper grit stones for your ring. Here's all the instructions you get right here on the end of the box. You gotta have a cutting fluid to wash away the abrasive and the material that you remove. Now this says to use their flex on oil or a 10W30 motor oil. I've got transmission fluid, so that's what I'm gonna use. It also tells you the appropriate RPM for this home. It changes based on diameter. 
and the number of strokes per minute to make sure you get the appropriate crosshatch strokes. All right, so we've got all these cylinders lubed up with transmission fluid. It's not gear oil, this just makes a good squirter. Uh, the recommended speed was what, five to 800? And this drill is supposed to do 500 on low. I wonder if it changes when the voltage goes up. I bet it does. So uh, it should be 500 or better. That's what we're gonna use. Uh, we've got all the balls lubed up with uh, transmission oil as well. So you wanna make sure you get the brush spinning before it goes in the bore. Spinning before it goes in and spinning until after it comes out. You don't wanna get any vertical scratches on the cylinder. All right, so now you all know that I can count to 10. It's actually looking really good already. Really good. I think I'll go ahead and hit it another 10, just to be sure. And then we'll clean it up and see what we've got. All right. I did 20 seconds with the hone. I know it's probably hard to tell on film, but it looks really good. If you see these vertical lines right about here, probably a little faint. That's just from the bore gauge. But I will say that uh, you can see them better right here. That's just from the bore gauge. Uh, but I will say that I did identify a very slight vertical scratch. Um, so I'm probably gonna hone it a little more. Ten more seconds. Now I'm cleaning it out with uh, the same transmission fluid that I'm lubing it with. Gonna hit it with a hot soapy water when we're completely done and go over the block one last time. All right, just trying to get it clean enough that it doesn't uh, get any grit scratches in my bore gauge balls. Gotta keep those balls clean, folks. So it didn't remove really any material or change the dimension in 30 seconds. So if you're concerned about overboring your cylinder with a bottle brush hone or something like that, just think 30 seconds did nothing. It would take several minutes of honing to probably remove a thousandth of an inch. Don't be scared. All right, we've got all our cylinders honed to uh, machine shop specs. Well, not exactly, but they're good enough. What is that? I've got engine on my face. All right, we got the uh, block cleaned, dried, and uh, back in the garage. I went ahead and cleaned off the crank as well and slapped it in there. Big thing with cleaning these is you're gonna wanna get an engine brush kit to get in all the small oil galleys and stuff. Uh, I think I got these off of uh, Amazon or something. I'll leave a link, but it's, it's clean. It's ready to go, cranks in there. I went ahead and uh, did some plastic gauge on one of the main bearing caps. The clearances should be spot on for a 50 year old engine because uh, we didn't do any machining. We just replaced the bearings and I do have micrometers and a bore gauge so I could check the oil clearance the professional way, but nobody else is gonna do that at home. so. I'm going to do it the way you would do it for this build. We went ahead and did it on this center main bearing. Looks like it's a little bit less than three thou. Uh, two and a half thou is the spec, I think. But uh, a little closer to three is fine. Um, it's an old engine and loose is fast. So I'd rather it be a little loose than a little tight. We're probably going to run a 1540 or 1550 oil anyway, or 2050. So. A little bit of extra oil clearance is not a bad thing for us. I'm not gonna waste any more time with any of the main bearings. I'm gonna clean that off. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, put some silicone on our two-piece rear main and a little bit of additional silicone in this area. Uh, lube up the crank good and go ahead and throw the rest of the main caps on. Well, I'm gonna show you what happens when you uh, get complacent, get in a hurry and just don't pay attention. That right there. That's uh. It's supposed to go there. It doesn't. It's 
put my caps on and wasn't paying to the orientation of this one and I had it flipped 180. I started tightening down the bolts and that kind of cracked. So I just knocked it all the way off and I'm going to send it. It's basically a three bolt main now. Budget build. Okay. So I was losing a little sleep over that busted main cap. So I had to do something to remedy the problem. And I honestly think I could run it just like it is, but my OCD's got the better of me. I'm about to fix this main cap with JB Weld. Just calm down a minute, it's not that bad. I hit it with the file to make everything fit-ish again. This oil pan rail was the flattest surface I could find, so I put a little tape on there to protect it. I'm gonna JB Weld that, sandwich it between these magnets, use this magnet to hold it perfectly in line this way, and I'm gonna let it dry. And tomorrow night, I'll file fit the end of that main cap to the block to make sure there's just a slight interference when I bolt it down. Hopefully the ear doesn't snap back off. And there it is. Just as much of a hack job as you would expect. And I'm not gonna call myself an engine builder yet, but I, I did make a custom uh, main cap uh, with JB Weld. So here's where we're at this morning. Last night, I gapped all the rings Top rings were almost all good, uh, but all of the second rings had to be gapped. Only two of the top rings had to be gapped. So here's my ring gapping setup. I've got one of these tools that just makes sure that the ring is square in the bore. And feeder gauges, if it needs to be gapped. I've got this ring filer here. And after I'm done filing, I've got an 800 grit stone to knock all the burrs off the gap in the ring. Now, if you don't have one of these, you don't want to buy one of these, you can always take an old piston and use that to press the ring down on the bore. All right, for this set of rings, we're going with the forced induction up to 15 pounds of boost, top ring, six thou times the bore diameter, and the second ring is six and a half thou times the bore diameter, and all the oil rings are much greater than 15. You won't have to mess with those more than likely. So I've got a minimum of 24 thou on the top ring. Some of them are a little higher. Actually, some of them didn't even need gapping. They were they were already big or bigger than they needed to be to start with. And 26 thou on the second ring. So the second ring gap is always a little bit bigger than the top ring gap. That keeps you from getting any pressure trapped between the rings and that causes like ring flutter and magic and stuff. So I've got them all gapped and zip tied in order, uh, in cylinder order number. So I need to get all these put on the pistons and try to get this short block wrapped up today. This is our old broken piston. That's my fault. 748 grams. This is our new non-broken silver light piston. 668 grams. If you do the quick uh, mathematicals, that's 80 grams of difference. That's a pretty good bit. That's over 10%. Matter of fact, it's about the same as this 13 16 socket. That's, uh, that's a lot of weight. So people complain about three or four grams in balance. Let's see what 80 does in this engine. So we're getting ready to install this extremely underweight piston. And uh, I've got a little bit of a Connecting rod, little end heating apparatus here. Pretty proud of this. Need to get that up to 500 degrees, and we're currently about halfway there. Well, there's a first. I've got birds <laughs> piston. Wife came home yesterday. Said sure was a bunch of birds flying around in the garage. Apparently, one of them relieved himself in one of my pistons. A shit bird. So you can see, I've got all the pistons up here on the uh, sterile work surface, paper towel, I mean. I've already put one piston in. Wanted to make sure I was uh, capable of doing it before I did it on camera. True story. That being said, I've got all the bores clean. I got a light coat of oil on them. Uh, quick note, coffee filters make a really good lint-free engine rag towel thing. Saw that on Humble Mechanic. Obviously important to stagger all your ring gaps, uh, put a little oil on the rings, make sure everything's good to go. Now that being said, 
piston rings don't just sit still for the rest of their life. I don't care how you put them in, they're gonna rotate around the piston as the engine runs. There's no real science to it. They just, they just do a little dance depending on how fast the engine's running and there's some magic involved, but they do rotate and eventually they might all line up and then you might get some excess oil burn for a short period of time, but that's just life. Here's our cam kit part number. It's got all the doodads in there. And there's the part number for the cam, XE262H. That's for hydraulic. It's a 218, 224 duration, 462, 469 lift. So the main reason I chose this cam was uh, this engine was never intended to live in this truck long term. Might not live very long at all now, but uh, my buddy's got a swamp bucket he wants to put it in. So I needed a cam that would sound good at idle and provide good low end torque. So this is just the cam I picked. And it'll work fine with our blower. I like to just lube up the last bearing journal and then stick it in the first bearing journal in the block. Hold it still while you put the lube on there. If you don't feel like less of a man when you're done doing this, you didn't do it right. Ugh, looks like I got really sticky tranny fluid on me. The bad kind. The way I like to support these when I put them in is I put one of the cam bolts in one of the holes I'm going to use this crowbar to give me some leverage. Yahtzee! Got the timing set installed. It's straight up. Well, it's off to the side a little bit. The point being is, I've got a degree wheel. I'm not going to degree the cam in because it's a budget build. And most people wouldn't degree it in at home, so I'm not going to. Uh, biggest thing to note here is these bolts will walk out on you. So either A, buy a cam retaining plate, which I didn't, or B, use some high strength Loctite on them. And make sure you clean the threads off on these bolts very well. If there's any grease on these bolts, you're wasting your time putting Loctite on. I think we had a good stopping place on the block, so I'm gonna start working on the heads. I'm gonna go ahead and break these down, pull the springs off, take the valves out, clean them up, lap the valves, and then put it all back together with the new comp cam springs. Just gonna lap these valves real quick. Uh, you can see that valve and seat have already been lapped. This one, not so much. You don't need a lot to do this. You need a lapping compound and a little stick doodad. All we're going to do is put a little compound on the seat of the valve. It's probably too much. It's okay. I put oil on the valve stem to lube the guide thing is you don't want to get any of this grit down into the valve guide. It cuts. Okay. All right. Just a suction cup. You'll find that if you lift it up, it helps draw the paste back down in there. If you do a good job of cleaning up the outside of your valves like I didn't, this goes a lot more easily. So that looks good enough. So I'm gonna clean up the seat here and uh, move on to the next ones. The big thing is you're gonna want to clean up the heads real good when you're done with this. You don't want any of this grit getting in the engine. So when I'm done with all the seats, I'm gonna take the head outside and give it a final bath. Nice. I got one head done. This is the last major piece of the puzzle. So I'm putting this head together. Uh, we got the valve in there with some assembly lube on it. New umbrella seal, new seal o-ring, and the cop cam springs, retainers, and keepers. Uh, there's my valve spring compressor tool. Pretty self-explanatory. Put this side on the valve head, this side on the spring side. Screwy, screwy, screwy. I, put, I like to put trans gel or some other grease on these. Uh, so when you stick them on the valve amongst all this nonsense, they don't fall back out. Let's do it. All right, the heads are assembled and cleaned. The surfaces are probably flat. I prayed over them a little bit. Same thing with the, the deck here. Uh, it's been cleaned, degreased, uh, factory style head gaskets that came in the uh, Summit re-ring kit. Right, I got the heads on, the bolts in, and they're ran down, not torqued. Uh, big thing, if your bolts go into your water jacket like mine, you're gonna wanna use a, a good high temp thread sealant for them. 
The torque spec is 65 foot pounds. I'm going to do a pass at 25, 45, and then 65. And the torque sequence just starts in the middle and works its way out like that. There's plenty of pictures on the interweb if you want to be exact about it. I'm going to go ahead and put all the lifters, uh, push rods and rocker arms, everything on. Get that buttoned up before I put the oil pan on the bottom because I don't trust myself not to drop something down there. <sighs> Finally about to put the oil pan on and this is a really good spot to screw up. There's two different seals that go between the oil pan and the front cover. Okay, the thin seal is for small blocks up to 1974. The thick seal is for small blocks 1975 and newer. This is a 1975 engine, so it's got the thick seal. You can take measurements on here and look on the interweb and it'll tell you which seal you're supposed to have if you don't know which year your engine is. As you can see, the oil pan is almost clean. It's good enough. I'm going to put some aviation jazz on the gasket and uh, silicone in the corners to help prevent a leak. But let's be real, it's a small block. They leak. Score one for the LS there. Things have happened off camera. Got the uh, timing cover on, the damper on, water pump on, oil filter on. I taped over the wick so it wouldn't get painted. I want you guys to know I'm using the right filter. Internet approved. Uh, but yeah, everything's painted up. Uh, what we want to do now is I'm going to go ahead and pour the oil in the lifter valley and go ahead and prime the engine with everything opened up so I can see what's going on. This is what we're using for braking oil. It's very important to use an actual braking oil. Oils aren't the same as they used to be. You need something with a lot of zinc and all the other chemistries in it. I don't care what your granddaddy said. You need a braking oil to break in a cam and piston rings. Did I mention you need to use a braking oil? And by the way, don't just drain it out after you've broken in your cam. You need the braking oil to seat the rings as well. It's got the right chemistries for all the friction and stuff. I don't like to give away all my secrets here, but these are the kind of things that are gonna put you ahead of the pack. You wanna make sure you always use the appropriate size funnel when you're pouring the oil into the engine. You don't want to spill anything. Well, that is viscous. That's a scientific word. It means thick. I'm not real certain I tightened the drain plug. And I'm a little bit worried about that right now. Man, didn't spill a drop. Ever wonder how long it takes to prime a new engine? I always did. We didn't have tools like this when I was a kid. We just cranked it up dry. Motors were tougher back then. Anyway, you can get these off the Amazon for like 20 bucks. I'll leave a link. Let's see how long it takes. Let's put it on the low. And the filter is dry. Oops. It's making some pressure. Let's try high. The other high. Well, there's that battery. Takes longer than that. Apparently it takes longer than that too. That is unfortunate. Take three. All right, we're starting to get oil up in our rockers, so that's good because I'm I'm about out of battery. I think I might. Uh, Give our engine a little rotation. Move things around a little bit. Where's my rotator? Rotator. Some of you are going to say take the spark plugs out and they'll roll over easier. They're backed out. There's no compression. Okay. Probably should have used a corded drill. Alright. 
pretty much all have some amount of oil in the rocker. So that lets me know they're all oiling. So we should be good to go. Just one more time. Well, I don't know about you, but I feel like that took longer than I would have expected. A solid couple minutes worth of priming to get oil everywhere in the top end. It's important. All right, just getting prepped to put the intake on. I've got the recommended Velpro gaskets. I put uh, Ultra Gray on the front and back china walls and some gasket cinch on the, uh, on the intake manifolds to hold them in place. The gaskets, that is. Ultra Gray. I'm a big fan of these little squirt thingamajigs. It's awkward. Nothing stressful about this at all. I'm gonna make sure and put thread sealant on the inner four bolts. Inner four bolts. Keeps the oil from coming up the threads. Not gonna lie, there's not a whole lot of room down in here to uh, work your magic. Put the old wobble socket on that one. It's extremely awkward. Um, it's not a good place for those. They'd find a way to fall down in the engine. Sure of it. The engine's at a good stopping point. I'm waiting on the bracketry for the front and a little bit of hardware here and there. So while we're waiting on those parts to get here, I got the SM465 uh, drag racing transmission up on the bench and I'm gonna tear into it and try to rebuild it. Never done that before, but the sink rows aren't aren't sinking, so I'm gonna tear it apart and try to put new sink rows and bearings and seals in it. I might even put a little paint on there week now, tomorrow I got a buddy coming to help me put the engine and transmission back in the truck so we got a lot to do today because here we have one mediocre small block with a broken main cap and out of balance rotating assembly a small blower and a free carburetor that's too small for the application I got a bell housing right there that needs to be painted I got a transmission case right there that needs to be put together all that's going on up here and I'm not gonna film it because well I don't have time all that's got to go together and be ready for tomorrow when he gets here so we can scooch it back in the truck. All right, things happened off camera. Got the engine and the transmission together on the hoist with the doodad. I'm not fighting this joker going back in. I spent the 30 bucks. Got help here today, so we're going to try to get the engine in the truck before the rain gets here again. Let's talk about everybody's favorite subject, electro digitals. This is the ignition setup I'm using on our small block blower motor. This is a standard GM style HEI. This one came from Proform because it said race on the box. It was a hundred bucks and had great reviews. I got an MSD 6 BTM, which is basically like a 6AL box that most people know. Uh, but it's got an adjustable doodad that you can take out um, zero to four degrees of timing per pound of boost. So that helps us out. Um, I had to pull the guts out of this distributor to just put the MSD harness in there. That hooks to that. It does magic. Um, blower motor is like a lot of initial advance. So I've got the lightest springs on here to get the most mechanical advance I can. Uh, quickly, I wasn't going to run the vacuum advance, but I guess I am now. It'll just give us a little more timing when we're cruising and down low. And then we can use the MSD box to pull out timing up top when we get into the boost so we don't have to worry about detonation so much so let's put all that together all right major project update i don't have the blower on yet but i'm about to put the blower on i wanted to wait and get all the plumbing and ignition done beforehand you see you got the alternator and the power steering on i used the ict billet uh, bracket kit worked out pretty well had to use a few 3 8 washers here and there to make that line up just perfectly but it is what it is I got my money's worth out of it so let's talk about the I guess unique things for this specific project for this intake manifold before we put the blower on you can't see stuff all right that's the factory thermostat housing I just painted it one thing to note is you can't take the thermostat housing off unless you take the blower off so something to think about uh that's custom black aluminum barb fitting thing for the heater 
That fitting is for the uh, temperature sensor for the Mishimoto electric fans. Now let's go around to the back side. This, oh, wow, quite the plumbing setup here. There's two ports to reference the manifold pressure. The small one down here I've got running directly to the MSD box. That's to boost reference the ignition. It will retard the timing when the boost comes up based on where I set the dial. Now I've got a little Christmas tree of 90s and T's here. That's what it took to make it fit around the distributor. This goes to the boost gauge. This is going to go to our boost referenced carburetor. And this goes to our vacuum advance module. So I have four boost references off this manifold. MSD box, vacuum advance, boost gauge, and boost reference carburetor. It's not that complicated, just a lot of hoses. You can see the little boost reference ports back there. This O-ring, rectangle ring, whatever you want to call it. This is the only thing that seals the manifold. This and six studs, torqued to 10 foot pounds. All right, let's talk about carburetors. It's the magic box on top of the blower that makes sure the air fuel mixture is correct. You young guys, that's a carburetor. This is a 650 Demon. Uh, it's a little step up from, hold on, I got another carb over here. All right, so a guy at work actually gave me these two carburetors, free. That's how bad people hate carburetors these days. This is a 4160 Holley, 600 CFM. This is a 650 Dominator, which is built off a of Holley 4150 platform. This has got a single feed. This has got dual feed. Uh, this one's got metering block on the primary only. This one's got dual metering blocks. So you got four corner idle. You've got see-through float bowls for adjusting your floats and such. Uh, 600's not big enough for this motor. 650's not big enough for this motor, but it's free, so that's what we're running. So this is a 350. It's gonna turn about 5,500 RPM. Uh, so if you do the math, I need a 750 CFM carburetor. Now, some of you are saying that's way too much carb, but I got a blower, so at seven pounds of boost, that blower is actually drawing about 50% more air through that carburetor than a naturally aspirated 350 would at 5,500 RPM. So I need a 750 at least, but I don't have one. So I'm running what I got, because it's free. That's okay. We're not planning to win any races with this motor. It's a budget build. Let's talk about carburetor basics for a minute. There's three typical circuits in a street carburetor. You got your idle circuit, your main circuit, and then your enrichment circuit. It's just like it sounds. The idle circuits, the idle adjustment screws for setting the mixture when it idles. Your main jets are the main circuits. So when you're cruising down the highway, your main jets are metering your fuel. So that's your cruising uh, fuel mixture. And then there's the enrichment circuit. And that's what we have to modify for a carburetor sitting on top of a blower. Your enrichment circuits basically, you got your accelerator pumps and your power valve. The enrichment circuits for those scenarios where you aren't idling or just cruising. When you put your foot on the gas, when you go up a hill or you do a smoky burnout to press some girl. When you step on the gas, a couple things happen. Those throttle blades open up, the engine vacuum drops, and the mixture goes lean. That's where this comes in. And that, accelerator pump shoots gas in to get that initial shot of gas to keep it from going lean, and this power valve opens up to enrichen up the main circuit. All right, we gotta modify the enrichment circuit on this carburetor to work with a draw-through blower application. This is the power valve. Vacuum holds it closed. 6.5 inches of mercury is what it takes to fight that spring and close this power valve. When the vacuum drops below 6.5 inches of mercury, the power valve opens and allows fuel to flow through that port and that port, and it enriches the mixture in the carburetor. Enrichment circuit. Make sense? In a normal carburetor application, the power valve is referenced under the carb, so basically a manifold vacuum. We got it on top of a blower, and on top of a roost blower, there's always going to be a high vacuum situation here, so that power valve will never open. So the enrichment circuit doesn't work. We got to fix that. So we're going to boof, boof. We're gonna boof, boof reference. So we're gonna boost reference the power valve under the blower. So instead of seeing the high vacuum scenario that's always between the carburetor and the blower, we can see the boost in the manifold below the blower. So when the engine goes in to boost, the power valve will open and fatten up the mixture, fat and happy. 
All right, let's break this down, clean it up in the carb dip, rebuild it, modify the power valve doodad, and get ready to fire this thing up. All right, draw through blower carb 101. I now have a draw through blower carb. This is the cavity where the power valve sits. And it's normally pulled close by a hole that's referenced to the base of the carburetor. I filled that hole with JB tank weld because it's for gas. Even though there's not gas in here, why not? It's putty and it sets up quick. Now, we need to get a boost reference to blow the blower and that's what this hose is all about. This is a 3 16th brake line and I've drilled through the side of the carb and it came out in here into this pocket. There's silicone on that hose and I've got some JB tank weld on there just to hold it steady. Same thing out here, it's just for support, not sealing. It should seal up fine. But either way, drill bit, some tank weld, some brake line, 15 bucks, and you've got a draw through blower carb. Let's go over a few things I did off camera. Obviously headers, I built an exhaust, dual three inch, terminates right behind the cab so it's obnoxious loud. Not a fan, but it is what it is, that's all I had time for. Got to redo my redone throttle cable. Uh, the wiring's kind of a hack job, but it'll get it in the garage and it'll serve its purpose for now. MSD box is mounted up. Uh, carbs carbon. Got the fans hot wired. Just a lot of hackery going on right here. But I got to get it cranked. I got to break in the cam and I got to get it in the garage before the rain gets here. So it is what it is. I got a lot of stuff to redo and a lot of stuff to finish before Saturday. So let's get at it. Don't ever think you're above crisscrossing your spark plug wires because uh, if you drink strong enough beer, you can do it. I did it the other day. Anyway, I know it'll bark because after I redid the plug wires, I hit it one good lick and it fired right off, but it didn't set the timing yet. So we need to set the initial timing at 10 degrees, I think. And then we're gonna jump right into cam break in, which is something like 20 minutes at about 2000 RPMs. I better look into that before I start. But either way, my neighbors are about to love me. All right, first fire, take eight. Now we're just trying to set the timing here. So I'm gonna fire it up, try to set the timing at 10 degrees and I'll cut it off, double check everything before we do cam break here. timing mark it ain't wide enough all right take 10 Still can't see my timing mark. A little loud in here. Uh oh, that's it. I gotta be honest, I don't know where that smoke came from, but apparently it fixed itself. Let's try again. <laughs> 